Good morning, everyone. My name is Gonzalo Artiach, and I'm an equity analyst here at ABG. The next presentation will be uh, Irlab Therapeutics, a company, a Swedish company focused uh, on the development of pharmacological treatments for uh, neurological disorders, with a primary focus in Parkinson's disease. With that being said, I will give the word to Nicholas Waters, the CEO. Please, Nicholas, the word is yours. Thank you very much, um, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as Gonzalo uh, informed, uh, Irlab is a company focusing on primarily on Parkinson's disease. We are building a pipeline in that domain. Uh, Gonzalo, can you change to slide three, please? Next slide. So, <coughs> at present, Irlab is in a quite new and uh, interesting position. We have a, a, a very strong, strong uh, cash position. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, since we have a big partnership with a, a global pharma company, Ipsen. Uh, we have two programs in clinical phase 2B, uh, studies we are running right now. Uh, and these are indications which have uh, quite, quite substantial uh, potential for uh, revenues in the future. Uh, we have a highly efficient uh, discovery platform uh, delivering new drug candidates over time. Uh, and we have uh, now uh, a number of preclinical assets moving towards uh, phase one. And also we have a, a proven <coughs> BD function, <coughs> sorry, with a, where we have built up a, a structure to be able to strike uh, further deals in the field based on our pipeline. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, over the years, we have um, uh, expanded our operations, and in parallel with that, we have also uh, been able to build up our uh, cash balance. And as you can see in the center uh, slide here, uh, since 2019, we have uh, expanded the cash situation uh, to now around 400 million at the end of the year, 400 million Swedish kroner, that is roughly 40 uh, million euros. So we have uh, been quite diligent in in making sure that we have uh, a runway for the for the commitments we we take in terms of uh, clinical development and preclinical discovery. As you can see, we have a uh, quite stable burn rate over each quarter since the uh, going back a few years. Uh, we burn around twenty five to thirty uh, million Swedish or three million euros per quarter. Uh, we expect to see a similar uh, burn rate uh, in the coming uh, period. Uh, next slide, please. As indicated in the beginning, we have a strong focus on Parkinson's disease, and this is a devastating uh, uh, neurodegenerative disorder uh, where you lose a number of uh, neurons in the brain, which leads to uh, uh, primarily motor complications, which are well known but also other symptoms, uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms and balance problems uh, over the course of the disease. And we have been targeting uh, various aspects of the complications uh, that occur during, uh, during the progression of the disease uh, with our programs. We have looked at the mechanisms responsible for the, uh, for the symptoms, and we are addressing those uh, by means of our ISP uh, discovery platform to discover new treatment strategies to address those uh, unmet needs. Next, please. Uh, we are using our uh, proprietary uh, ISP platform, the integrative screening process. It's a, it's a, a phenotypic uh, strategy where we use uh, machine learning and AI to support uh, design and evaluation of uh, novel molecules uh, active in the brain. This, is, this allows us to discover uh, unique and new classes of CNS uh, compounds, which we pursue in clinical development. Next slide, please, Gonzalo. So this is the pipeline. Uh, <clears throat> once again, at the top, Mestopotam, uh, which is a drug designed to treat dyskinesias, which are involuntary uh, movements in Parkinson's disease, but also to treat psychosis, which is a common symptom in Parkinson as well. And then pirapamat, um, uh, which is a drug designed to improve balance and reduce falls. In both these instances, we, we are 
uh, the first molecules or the first we have the first compounds in two new uh, CNS classes addressing these complications. Uh, we judge that we are four to five years ahead of any competition in those areas. Uh, then we have the PWA1 and PWA3 uh, preclinical discovery and development programs. The PWA1 program, we are now pursuing uh, one uh, clinical candidate, a uh, candidate towards clinical development, and that is to improve cognitive function primarily, but also to treat, uh, uh, to increase brain health in neurodegenerative disorders, including Parkinson, of course. And then the PW3 program, where we are developing a new, new type of treatment for the, the or, um, principal symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the partnering strategy for these, uh, uh, these assets is uh, quite simple. We are, we are focusing on uh, reaching deals at proof of concept. That's somewhere in phase two. However, uh, uh, with an, an increased interest in our pipeline and our work, we have also now started discussing uh, uh, the preclinical programs, where we're looking at uh, the possibility to partner preclinical programs already before uh, or uh, in conjunction with phase one studies. Uh, next, please. Uh, as mentioned, we have a, a licensing deal. We, we struck that this summer uh, with, with Ipsen, and that is to pursue the development of Mestopatan to a product on the market. Uh, and this has opened up a, a number of possibilities for us. First of all, uh, we've been on a, a growth path for the fast past uh, three years now. We have increased our number of uh, employees from around 15 to around 30 today, uh, supporting the programs and discovery and development, mainly in the late stage development uh, efforts. Uh, our current uh, focus is, of course, um, to expand the clinical operations. We are now running uh, two large international uh, phase 2B studies. Uh, we are increasing our business development efforts and our IR efforts. We have an organizational focus quite, uh, right now on the PFMOP study, uh, which uh, is designed to prevent falls. This is a huge undertaking for us. We're doing a 165 patient study across European countries. Uh, and then in the PWA1 program, uh, we are focusing on, on two different symptomatologies in, this, in the sector. Uh, that is cognitive uh, function uh, and apathy. I'll come back to apathy. It's an interesting uh, problem for people with neurological disorders. And then the PWA3 program, of course, we are now looking for, forward to uh, defining a new CD in that uh, program for development. Next, please. So, uh, with our diligence strategy, we have uh, now, uh, in the period we are now, 20 to 23, we have kind of built the base for uh, a growth, the growth strategy that we have employed right now. We have, uh, as I said, a number of pre uh, clinical assets in development uh, with good prospects of delivering uh, uh, interesting and valuable data to patients and to uh, uh, the society. Uh, besides that, we are uh, further developing our uh, discovery platform, um, improving its performance uh, further, and we are uh, working uh, with our BD, BD uh, efforts to, to find additional partners for, for the programs that we have uh, generated. Uh, we expect to be able to uh, conclude uh, phase two, phase three study or phase two B studies within the uh, within 23 for both of these programs. We we will also uh, see the start of phase three studies uh, early to mid uh, early mid uh, 20s, and uh, by the uh, mid to late mid 20s we expect to to have our first marketing authorizations uh, submitted. Next slide, please. Uh, a slight deep dive into the, uh, the preclinical assets and the PW1 program, which is a quite uh, interesting uh, uh, class of compounds that we have discovered, uh, and it has been nominated by WHO as a totally new class of uh, CNS active compounds. We thought it was our duty to uh, 
to add a number of molecules in this space. Uh, if one looks at the uh, potential market here, uh, about 12% of all adults uh, over 65 uh, enter up in uh, a position of cognitive decline uh, during their life. Uh, and this is especially so in neurodegenerative disorders, neurological disorders. Um, with uh, that comes also uh, a quite common symptom, uh, perhaps the most common symptom in uh, neuropsychiatry and neurology, and that's apathy. Uh, and that is uh, estimated that over 10 million uh, individuals in the US suffer from apathy. And that also extends into the caregivers, uh, complications for caregivers. This is quite a big problem. There is no uh, uh, pharmacological uh, treatment available today, which has been proven. Uh, and we see a huge potential here. Uh, the problem uh, with both the cognitive decline and, and the following apathy is a disruption of certain neuronal pathways in the frontal lobes of the brain. Uh, and we have seen that uh, drugs within the, or experimental compounds in the PW1 program can actually restore function in exactly those uh, pathways. So we see a huge potential in this, in this group of molecules. On the right side here, you can see the uh, prevalence of, uh, from various studies, uh, prevalence of apathy as a, as a sim symptom in various neurodegenerative disorders. And you can see in Parkinson's disease, up to 70% of patients are suffering from apathy. Next, please. In the PW3 program, we are focusing our uh, efforts now and looking at uh, early stages of Parkinson, the initial uh, symptomatology, rigidity, uh, stiffness, uh, shaking. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, the, the common treatment there is levodopa. Levodopa has its uh, fantastic benefits, but also uh, some uh, drawbacks. And that is the constant administration of levodopa that is necessary up to in some cases, even up to eight, 12 times a day you take your pills. This creates uh, a quite substantial variation in the plasma concentration and as such also the, uh, the response. Uh, <clears throat> there is another compound, apomorphine, that is used to rescue motor function uh, in uh, many patients. This is also a compound with a very, very short half-life. It doesn't stay around in the body for a long while, uh, around half an hour or so. It has quite quite good effects, but uh, you need to take it often. Uh, so we see a quite substantial opportunity here, uh, the potential to transform the treatment paradigm for uh, Parkinson's disease with a long-acting uh, strategy, uh, administering drugs at uh, quite uh, low doses, which could sustain motor function over uh, a 24-hour cycle or 12-hour cycle, actually. Right now, we are in uh, lead optimization uh, with the first generation of molecules, and, and then this, uh, we have a second generation of molecules uh, in the making. Uh, we're looking at candidate in identif identification there. Uh, if everything goes well, we expect to be able to see uh, potential candidates during this year. Uh, next slide, please. A few words on Peter Pemot. Um, if you can move ahead. Uh, to the next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Peter Pemot, as I said, is designed to improve balance. Uh, and balance, balance is governed by many systems in the brain and the body. But there is one very essential uh, function that is uh, occurring in the forebrain as well. Uh, Mr. Peter Pemot has the potential to strengthen those functions of the brain and, and, and the potential to reduce falls. We have completed a phase 2A study where we have seen uh, improvement in balance uh, and a reduced risk of falling. Falling is a huge problem in, in Parkinson's disease. Around half of all patients uh, fall uh, recurrently. Uh, this leads to uh, fall injuries and also to quite substantial costs, both for the uh, people uh, suffering or living with Parkinson, but also for uh, the payers' society. So there is a possibility of actually receiving a quite substantial price on a compound like this for a treatment uh, addressing falls. And as I said before, we are uh, ahead of competition here uh, with our phase 2B program right now. Uh, next, please. 
Just before Christmas, we received approval to initiate this study uh, across a number of countries in, in Europe. So we are uh, now initiating uh, uh, sites uh, across Europe to be able to recruit uh, patients for this uh, uh, quite interesting and, and uh, from the physician's point of view, popular study. Uh, this is a huge problem for, for patients, and we are focusing on, focusing on one of the biggest problems for Parkinson patients. The primary objective of the study is, of course, to uh, look at the false frequency and see if Pripomat can reduce that. So based on the phase-to-A data, data, we have good, good hopes. We will also uh, follow up with a number of other aspects of Parkinson's symptom, uh, so Parkinson symptomatology uh, in this study, such as the cognitive and the, uh, the standard uh, Parkinson symptoms. Uh, <clears throat> so this study is now uh, in the making. Next, please. A few words on Mestalpotam, which we have partnered with uh, together with uh, uh, Ibsen. Uh, can you shift the slide to the uh, further one more? One more slide, uh, Gonzalo. There. Um, this is a drug which we have discovered uh, using our ISP um, system. Uh, it is a, a compound which acts in the exact pathways uh, which which generate the uh, involuntary movements uh, in Parkinson's disease and levodopa-induced dyskinesias so-called PD leads. Uh, this affects about 30% of all patients, um, and there are very few um, treatment options today. Uh, so there's a great unmet need. There is no, no treatment registered in Europe. There is a registered compound in the US, uh, an old uh, molecule, which has some drawbacks in terms of side effects, which we don't see with the uh, mestopotam. So we have a, a, com a competitive, uh, competitive advantage in that sense. Uh, this is a molecule that also displays antipsychotic-like properties in models of Parkinson's disease. So uh, we believe uh, that PDP could be a secondary uh, indication for this uh, compound. PDP or psychosis in Parkinson's disease is quite common. Around 35% of all patients uh, experience this symptom. And there are very few treatment options uh, which are tolerable to uh, uh, Parkinson patients. Uh, as a third uh, option, there is also tardive dyskinesia, which is a neurological syndrome uh, inflicted uh, in people living with psychosis by the treatment. And this is also dependent on an excess of dopamine D3 receptors in certain areas of the brain. And since mestopotam, inhibits dopamine D3 receptors, we have, uh, uh, we believe that uh, mestopotam could be a, an alternative treatment for uh, tardive dyskinesia. And this is a quite large market as well, both in terms of patients and the pricing of current treatments, which are based on old technologies, uh, is uh, very, very premium. There are prices around 60 to $70,000 per year for a treatment for, for TD today. Next, please. I just wanted to uh, inform everyone uh, about the fact that we have a Capital Markets Day uh, coming up on March 22, and we uh, like to invite anybody who wants to come and listen to our growth strategy uh, for the coming years. Gonzalo, over to you. Thank you very much, Nicolas, for this nice presentation. And now we have a few minutes for a Q&A session. And I would like to start asking you about the Pirepemat phase 2P trial for treating uh, falls that you will start uh, soon. Uh, yep. I was I was I was wondering uh, um, because I, you you showed the presentation on the presentation now that you will also target several several secondary endpoints and one of them yep. is cognitive function and my question yep. is would a positive result in the secondary endpoint endpoint for for cognitive fu function be enough for uh, transitioning to a phase three or you would have to run another phase to be trial uh, for cognition. As always, it 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 uh, depends on the uh, on the magnitude of the effect. Uh, this is a three month study. Uh, usually, cognitive function is studied in in, in longer trials. However, we saw a quite substantial uh, or a, a quite strong signal 
of cognitive improvement in the uh, phase 2A, which was only a one-month trial. So we believe that could be a, a possible outcome of the phase 2B. Now it's a secondary. Uh, it's hard to build a, a, a phase 3 program on a secondary. But uh, um, given the strong link between cognitive function and uh, improvement in falls, um, we think that the signal, uh, and based on our, our modeling, we think that the, the signal that we can pick up in, in falls will be the stronger one uh, in this study. Uh, however, um, correlated with improvements in, in uh, uh, cognitive function. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And my second question is around Mesdopetam and uh, the 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 deal that you have done, uh, the successful deal with with Ibsen. And yes. I was wondering if you could give us some words on how the deal was structured and especially how this deal would affect uh, follow-up indications, for example, Parkinson's disease, psychosis, and tardive dyskinesia. Um, of course, we are prohibited to, to discuss the, the, the details of the, of the uh, deal uh, further beyond what we have published already. Uh, this is a $363 million deal. Uh, it is not uh, a very backloaded uh, uh, deal. It is uh, evenly distributed over the development process. We have uh, options for for uh, additional indications, such as the ones I've indicated here in the presentation today, uh, going forward. And we have a, a double digit uh, uh, royalties coming at the end of the, uh, starting with the first sale, basically. Uh, and, and of course, a few sales milestones, uh, as, these, as these deals are usually structured. So it's, it's, it's not a very different deal from what you usually see in the industry. Okay, thank you very much. And my following question is about the COVID-19 uh, situation. Have you had any impact in patient recruitment in the in the trials that you're, you're running now? And especially, uh, what would you do if a new wave would come uh, in the following year? Hopefully it doesn't happen, but if it happens, uh, how would this affect the recruitment of the new phase 2B trial for Pirepimat? That's the, I hate to say it, million dollar question. Uh, uh, we see a drop in in the uh, in the spread of COVID in Europe right now. Um, we also see a drop in the US. Uh, for the ongoing study, uh, uh, Mestopetam trial, we have seen uh, impacts of COVID over during the late fall uh, and the winter uh, last year and this year uh, with the Omicron, uh, uh, the occurrence of Omicron. Uh, we are doing what everybody else is doing, mitigating this by expanding uh, more sites, more uh, more sites, and in regions where there are less uh, less infections. So um, we, uh, uh, along with everybody else doing clinical trials, have to manage this uh, as we go along. Uh, our guidance currently is that we we um, uh, will have re uh, fully recruited the study uh, in May, end of May, um, the seven the Mastopetam uh, trial. However, um, we will come uh, back with further guidance should that change. Um, we are targeting 140 patients ish. We can expand that if we find that necessary or want to do that. There are different reasons to do that. Uh, and expand the, the number of sites is uh, our primary uh, objective uh, to be able to conclude in, uh, uh, within the time frame we have uh, uh, given guidance on. Thank with you very Pirepimat, much. Uh, sorry, but with Pirepimat, we have the same situation there. Uh, we sh probably should be happy that we didn't start uh, earlier last fall uh, with the study because uh, because of the COVID situation. We have seen um, colleagues in the in the in the specific Parkinson field who have not started studies at all or have postponed studies or have uh, ended them early. So we've been lucky during this this quite tough period. Okay, thank you very much. And one last question on my side. Uh, with the situation you have now in terms of funding, what are your current priorities? The priority right now is to uh, start uh, and get going with the, with the recruitment in the Pirpemont study. We expect 18 months uh, of full recruitment on that. Besides that, conclude the Mestopetam trial uh, and then also bring 
uh, additional compounds to phase one within our uh, portfolio. And this will all be done within the uh, current, uh, current cash position. Great. Thank you very much, Nicholas Waters, for this presentation. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.